Darlene Slack, and I have the privilege of introducing to you the winners of the 2021 Florence B. Allen Writing Contest. My appreciation to the judges, to every student who took the courageous step in entering the contest, to the winners for the extra time that they devoted to fully developing their pieces, and to our campus for continuing to offer this and occasionally offer creative writing classes when able to do so. We did not award winners this year for the fiction contest and there's only one winner in the writing across curriculum contest, simply because pieces were close, but not quite where they needed to be for the standard quality of the FBA contest. Thanks for the time to enjoy sharing our students wonderful work. Andrew Muirfield won first place in the creative nonfiction genre for his personal essay titled Childish Pride. Andrew is a third year English major at OSU Mansfield. He enjoys writing fiction, especially fantasy and about life experiences. As he describes himself, I'm a nostalgic person who likes to laugh while looking back at life experience, hence childish pride. As he writes, Andrew says, having a good cup of coffee and music are necessary. In addition to writing, he also enjoys fishing, hunting, camping, playing guitar, and spending time with his wife, Chelsea, whom he met at OSU Mansfield. We learned this semester in our creative writing class how beautifully Andrew writes about nature with such nice descriptive detail but he also writes well about human nature, which is the essay, Childish Pride. What the judges had to say about this work, during a day of mandatory fun, a family trip to Wyandotte Lake Water Park, one child wrestles with his reluctance to be a child. Childish Pride walks the line between self-indulgence and self-deprecation to create a comedic tale of adolescent angst. Congratulations, Andrew, on a job well done. Childish pride. I'm not sure why, but it appears my antisocial attitude has been with me for a while, apparently since early childhood. I didn't like going places. I didn't like meeting people. I just wanted to stay at home. Unfortunately, being a kid, I wasn't allowed to stay at home by myself. I never understood that. I could feed myself, go to the bathroom on my own, and I knew fire was bad. What else did I need to know? Family trips always seemed like a mandatory day of fun. While my cousins jittered with anticipation, I ached with misery. When I was a little kid, my family took an annual trip to a water theme park. Hurry up! Let's go! In the car! Mom shouted, holding an igloo cooler, a folded up plastic lawn chair, and her sunglasses as she assisted the other cattle wranglers rounding up the herd of children. Here we go again, I thought every time this cruel and unusual punishment, described as fun, took place. The presence of moans and eye-rolling was inevitable. It was happening and there was nothing I could do about it. Us children were packed into an old minivan, nearly piled on top of one another. You can imagine the screams coming from the rear of the vehicle, as one child decided it was his turn on the Game Boy, or it was her turn to use the portable CD player that skipped with every bump. Now picture me, long, unkept hair, hand-me-down shorts, covered with bright zigzags and dots, and a black tank top. I would most likely be pl placed in the main back of the clunky minivan, pressed against the window, my head bouncing with the motion of the road as the sun blinded me, inducing a rage unexplainable to this day. The feeling of being cooped up in the back of a dirty old minivan and being forced to listen to the constant shouting of my counterparts drove me insane. I didn't understand why it was so difficult to sit quietly or to speak with the slightest bit of control without shouting or screaming. The drive was entirely too long, over an hour long. I know it seems silly now, thinking of one hour being too long to sit in a car, but imagine being a small child and one hour is an extended period of your existence. <clears throat> this park has since been renamed but was called Windout Lake. It was right next to the Columbus Zoo. As you neared the entrance, you had to quickly make a left or a right, depending on which park you wanted to enter. This proximity to the zoo, naturally, often created a sudden rift in the universe of Family Fun Day. Inevitably, the Congress of Youngsters took a vote. The vote often resulted in the continuation of the trip to the water park, 
generating a few moments of animosity when first entering the water park. My undeserved sense of self-righteousness and competence often restrained me from casting my vote, allowing the children of the Chrysler to cast their votes and grievances without my participation. I was equally unhappy, regardless of the overcrowded and overpriced park chosen. As we arrived, I stared at the long line of parents and children waiting to enter the park. I couldn't believe how happy they were. Pleading children, tugging on their parents' arms, couldn't hold back their requests for snacks and gift shop items before even entering the park. I contemplated the inevitable search for our van in the overpacked parking lot. Oh shoot, where did we park? I imagined my mom asking. Once entering Wandot Lake, nobody complained, other than me, of course. Following the herd of wild and chaotic chanting children, ignoring the encouragement from my mom, I walked with my head lowered into the jungle of ill-behaved monsters. I felt the shame of being forced to go into the park, to watch others enjoy themselves, baking in the summer sun and sitting with my arms crossed as everyone, besides myself, laughed and enjoyed themselves. My shame came from the simple fact I was there. I felt as if I were an adult, as if I were too old for these things, and was still being forced to go. This feeling of being too old for things has always been with me. Halloween of 96, at the age of 5, my angry mother brought me home because I didn't want to go door to door with my face painted up like Sting from WCW. I felt stupid and hated others looking at me dressed up. I rolled my eyes as children dressed up as other wrestlers waved at me. I wondered how they could possibly be enjoying themselves. Didn't they feel like show ponies being marched down the street for the adults' amusement? Adults opened their front door, smiling and laughing. Wow, look at you! They cheered with an excitement, which they assumed I believed was genuine. I knew I didn't look like Sting. Sting is six foot something tall and extremely muscular. I was a little blonde boy with noodle arms and basketball shorts on. This feeling of embarrassment while trick-or-treating was the same embarrassment I felt at Wyandotte Lake. As the other children laughed and played in the water, I sat with the adults. After spending countless hours sitting next to the grown-ups at whatever heart attack inducing junk food stand they had plopped in front of, while the youth of the wagon trail played in whatever plastic-filled, pea-infested, speedo-inhabited germ pool, I eventually grew tired of the boredom. I watched my cousins splash and laugh, and I realized I could have the fun they were having too. I argued with myself for what felt as long as Frodo's quest to destroy the ring. I could feel the sun burning the back of my neck as I gazed down upon the ice cream and chocolate-covered bugs roaming the metropolitan wasteland of bubblegum wrappers and corndog sticks. <clears throat> As I watched the citizens of this unknown and unmapped city go about their daily lives, I could hear the water splashing on the concrete from sprinklers. I could feel the misty breeze wafting in from the floating playgrounds. It felt nice. It was a relief. <clears throat> no adult cared I didn't want to play in the water, and that I was roasting like a lobster on the side of a highway. The adults only cared about their mind-numbing conversations, revolving around pot roast recipes, last year's mushroom hunting harvest, or how their community style of a sewing of a quilt was going. I couldn't stand it any longer. Did you see the mushroom Pauline found back at Ray's? Mom would ask Aunt Penny. Oh yeah, I think that's the one I stepped over, Aunt Penny would respond. This response was all too common, and a response heard by anyone referring to a trophy shroom someone else had found. Every so often, my mom glanced over at me. She saw her youngest of three sitting on a wooden, wooden picnic bench, wooden picnic table bench, his arms crossed, or his hands grasping his chin, holding his head. She smiled, and without words, using only her eyes and her smile, suggested I go have some fun. I rolled my eyes and turned away. I did not want her to look at me, because I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed that it was so obvious I wasn't having a good time, while everyone else was. I felt angry at how happy everyone else was. I stood up from the ketchup and mustard stained slab of wood and told my mom I was going into the water. She looked up at me and a smile of sudden surprise dashed across her face. She couldn't have been happier. She stood up to help me take my shirt off, but I quickly shot down the gesture. I was six years old after all. I wasn't a kid anymore. The thin blonde hairs sticking from just above my lip assured me of this. I wasn't doing this for fun. I was doing this to get away from the conversation that seemed like a bigger threat to my mind than the drugs so vividly described as an egg being fried on a sidewalk were depicted on TV. I figured... Swimming in the lemonade of others was better than subjecting my ears to the tedious conversations of the adults. I removed my shirt and made my way towards the large, artificial pirate island play pool. At first, I just stood there, gazing off into the water, watching my cousins laugh and cheer. I hated it. 
I stared with a disdain only known to those in traffic court, fighting a ticket for going three over the limit. However, I stepped in the water. The water was cold. The floor of the pool was rough and grainy, like frozen sand. I continued to walk into deeper water. It started to feel not so bad. I almost enjoyed myself for a moment. A massive structure of rope bridges, swings, sprinklers, and other large oversized artificial objects caught my eye. As the other kids played, I made my way towards the structure. I concealed my excitement, at least I assumed I was concealing it. Thinking about it, I was so focused on the structure, I have no idea if anyone was looking at me at all. I waded through the rough waters, and to my surprise, I was enjoying myself. My guard had finally been lowered as I smirked in the chest-high water. As I grew closer to the structure, a blaring bell rang. I wasn't sure what it was. I hadn't heard it before, but it seemed to influence the other children playing in the area. They all began to run back to the shore, but I continued forward. My, co my cousin yelled my name, Andrew, Andrew, come on, but I ignored him. I thought, you play your childish games. This is the only thing worth doing here. He shrugged his shoulders. How could I ignore him, he may have thought, but I wondered how he dare disturb me, no doubt attempting to get me to join in some infantile game of chicken or Marco Polo. I was finally in the water. I had spent hours sitting in the sun, baking, listening to the adults talk, and now I was finally enjoying myself. It took a lot to get me in the water, to let go and enjoy myself. I couldn't wait and gazed at every aspect of the structure. I saw bridges and imagined myself running across them. I saw ropes and imagined myself climbing up them. The mist hit me in the face, cooling my body as I grew closer. Once I was a mere few feet from the ship, I heard the shouting of my cousins, mixed with the laughter of unknown adults sitting in their chairs. I looked toward the shore just long enough to see cousins waving their arms in the air, accompanied by the desperate shouting of my mom and aunts. In memory, my mom's eyes displayed fear and terror as her hands covered her mouth. However, this is likely my childhood mind, continuing to influence me to this day. She was likely laughing at the fate I was about to suffer. Then I looked up, and a gigantic brown barrel began to tip from the top of the structure. It was full of water, thousands of gallons. I crouched down as fast as I could, bracing for the impact of Hurricane Andrew. The water crushed me. It pushed me underneath the water I stood in. As I was submerged, fear and panic rushed over my body. My lungs filled with water as my nose burned from the chemicals. My elbow burnt as it scraped across the floor of the pool, and my ears were instantly plugged. I couldn't see the surface of the water. I lost my sense of direction. Finally, I was able to stand. With fresh oxygen rushing through my lungs, <clears throat> I rubbed my burning eyes and inhaled deeply. I had just survived a monsoon. I couldn't believe I was alive. The relief I felt after bringing my head above water was indescribable. Goosebumps and shivers rushed from head to toe as I continued to gasp. The ability to hear returned to me as water dripped from my ears. My long, shaggy hair covered my most of my face, and I brushed my hand over it, putting it back in its place. The sounds of laughter grew loud from the crowd of undoubtedly impressed onlookers of my heroic endeavor. The laughter was at first understood as cheers. I smiled as I looked onto them, those creatures of the coast. However, my relief and satisfaction were quickly replaced by the utmost shame and embarrassment. I looked down and saw the force of the water had removed my shorts. I stood in front of hundreds of strangers, naked. Some parents covered their children's eyes, Others laughed and pointed, rolling in their lawn chairs hysterically. Even my cousins were laughing. My mom waved me in with a look of pure love and sympathy. There I staggered, pulling my shorts back to their rightful position upon my waistline through the treacherous waters of Wyandotte Lake. Those evil and wicked waters of the deep, where many watches, earrings, necklaces, and rings have met their fate. The fear of death was over, but my underlining issue of feeling embarrassed or too old to play was nothing but confirmed. That day, Wyandotte Lake took my pride, a pride I so desperately tried to hold on to. There, at the bottom of the artificial aquatic grave, lies the pride of a child that I held. Looking back at this humorous event, I see the feelings I had then are feelings I still hold to this day. I do not dance at parties. I do not sing at karaoke. I have a very hard time smiling, and the reasons for this are the same reasons I did not want to go in the pool at Wyandotte Lake. They are the same, same reasons I felt funny trick-or-treating. I'm not, not sure why these feelings exist within me, but I know one thing. The last time I let go of my pride and tried to enjoy myself, I lost my shorts. Mason Mullins tied for second place in the creative nonfiction genre for her prose poem titled Summer Haze. A freshman majoring in English, Mason loves to read poetry, stories, 
and listen to music. She also helps edit poems and stories written by friends, and she enjoys spending time with family. She especially enjoys writing poetry and stories with fantastical elements. Her mother reads what she writes and Mason says, thankfully, she's brutally honest. Mason likes to write whenever and wherever she can and finds it helpful to set aside a day just for writing. This semester, it's Fridays. Her impressive commitment and talent for writing with compelling imagery has been noticed in our creative nonfiction class this semester. Summer Hayes, Mason says, was inspired by sleepless nights and the exhaustion that accompanies them. The judges wrote this, we applaud this piece for its experimental style, its compact yet compelling narrative, thoughtful examination on the vitality of the human and non-human bodies that keep us from ever really being alone. Congratulations, Mason. I am alone. Not really, the dog is home. But I am alone and the heat seethes and blisters in the house. I open my bedroom window, wedging a dumbbell between its flaking teeth. It holds its mouth open, wide for what little breeze there is to curl in. It falls like a blanket on me, soft and gentle on my hot skin. I lay on my bedroom floor, my spine banks me. I reach my hand back and twist the knob on my little black radio. Kurt Cobain's voice makes my head soft and numb as he rips through the room, rushing, jumping for that open mouth, that breathing window. Strumming up my idle thoughts, he strikes through me, carving me out, leaving me empty. He puts a lump in my throat and leaves me laying on the floor. I can't let you smother me, we say it in perfect unison. My eyes are heavy, sleep is crawling up on me. It grins as it presses my eyes shut. It tries to lure me off into that summer slumber of sweat and ache. The CD skips. My eyes snap open. A curse spills from my mouth, angry and rushed. Sleep stumbles off out the window, defeated, dragging its feet. I am awake. The dog barks. Mom and dad are home from a date. They do that sometimes. They should do it more often. They say they've loved each other in a thousand other lives. I can believe it. The way they stagger in, drunk on one another's laughter, I click the radio off. David Wallace Redding tied for second place in the creative nonfiction genre with his essay, Rambo, My Friend. David started writing prolifically as a middle schooler when he participated in Power of the Pen a series of writing contests for middle schoolers throughout Ohio. David also enjoys horseback riding, hiking, video games, movies. What inspired this particular writing was the sadness that accompanied the death of a little lamb on his family's farm. The lamb, he said, had that great of an impact on his early years. The judges wrote this about Rambo, my friend. The opening sentence lets the reader know exactly where this story is going. Still, the predictable narrative arc allows the reader to dwell not in the action of the story, but in the affective dimension of human experiences. This piece reminds us that feelings are what make memories and stories matter. David is an inspiration in his current creative nonfiction class with his wonderful details his sense of empathy and his introspection. Congratulations, David. This is a reading of my story, Rambo, My Friend. Livestock are not supposed to have names, just tags and numbers. Many people agree with this sentiment. and It is a sentiment that is understandable. When you send one to market, you do not want to be attached to them. It is not reasonable. You will suffer guilt for having them butchered. When my family had our run with shepherding, I was 10 years old. I seemed to have missed the whole idea of not naming livestock and gave 
every sheep we ever owned names. The ones we first purchased were two ewes that I named Susan and Fiona. All the ones that followed had names too, but for the sake of not boring anyone to death, I will refrain from sharing them. Save for one, Rambo the Lamb. Fiona birthed Rambo in September, early September, I believe. Rambo was a significant lamb in the sense that he was the first sheep born on our property. Fiona took special care of Rambo. I think it might have been her first lamb she ever gave birth to. I remember her sticking close to his side often and making sure he was all right. Right from the start, I noticed something special about Rambo. He loved interacting with humans. When I would go out to feed him and the others, he always got so excited, like a loyal dog, and would joyously headbutt my leg and sprint off quickly and purposely, as if he were inviting me to play tag or hide-and-seek. When he saw I was not chasing him, he ran quickly back to the barn to see me. This was not an occasional affair either. We had this interaction every day. He would always play his little self-made game with me, headbutting my leg and running back and forth again and again. He would love it when I petted him. The sheep described in movies and media seemed nothing like Rambo. Rambo was special, and I grew to love him very quickly. It's very safe to say that I loved Rambo with all the love I could muster. He was my greatest friend. At school, I could not quite form the friendships with humans as I could with Rambo. There is a certain disconnect that did not exist between me and my woolly friend. Whenever anyone came to our house, I would make it a point to show them Rambo. I wanted them to see how wonderful he was. I wanted them to see the joy he radiated. I was proud of my friend. friend. In the word of the wise American Indian chief, Dan George, Rambo made my heart sore. I thought these days would go on forever. I could imagine him getting older and bigger and watching his horns curl. He would be huge. He would be tough. And that was a pleasant thought. When lambs turn about a month, it is customary to have their tails taken off to prevent infection. Therefore, as was tradition, when Rambo turned a month, he went through this procedure. A rubber band was applied to his tail to cut off the circulation, eventually let the tail fall off. All seemed to go without a hitch. Rambo was brave, and a few days passed by with no change. When I woke up on the third day since the procedure to remove Rambo's tail, I remember how dreary it was. It looked like the scene out of an Edgar Allan Poe poem. The sky had that grayish tone that seemed to suck the energy right out of even a very productive person. It was October, so such days did occur, but this day felt particularly dreary and cold. It was not really a cold brought on by the weather, but a coldness of feeling. There is this certain air of premonition that passed through my mind. As I slowly made my way out to the barn, I was excited to interact with my friend. His tail had come off the day before and all seemed to be well. I opened the door to the barn and all sheep were accounted for in the stable. Save for Rambo. I panicked. He was usually there. Then I went out to check the pasture. The grass was browner and dead looking. I looked and found my friend lying in a shallow hole where a tree was supposed to go. His usual expression of joy and happiness was gone. All that remained was tired eyes that seemed like they could barely stay open, and a body that looked broken and weak. He was quite obviously ill, gravely ill. I ran into the house to grab my father and bring him out to examine Rambo. He knew right away that something went wrong with the operation to remove his tail. We took him to the vet quickly. I was hoping beyond hope that the vet could turn the tide of this great storm. He could not. All he could give us was a diagnosis. Late stage tetanus. There was nothing we could do. My father had to go to work, so he asked my older sisters to pick me up and take me to school. It was a school day, and so I had to go. But I did not want to. I wanted to stay with my friend who had brought me way more joy in his month of existence than academia would ever bring me. Academia. However, I listened to my father. My sisters were kind to leave school. I'm sure it was not easy. Both were in the later years of high school when the success of school meant a lot. But they knew their brother was suffering deeply. School could wait. 
They arrived. My sister Hannah driving her beige-colored minivan with Kate riding shotgun. We placed Rambo on a towel in the back seat. I sat with him. His condition continued to deteriorate. A sorrowful song started playing on the radio. Hannah, with glistening tears in her eyes, saw Rambo slightly moving his head to the music. Look, Rambo's dancing to the music, she said. And she said it with a selfless desire to ease my troubled heart. He really did look like he was somehow connecting with that song, like it was comforting him. They dropped me off at school and I said little about Rambo's condition. I knew that my classmates simply could not comprehend the sorrow a boy felt for his ram. In their mind, sheep were for food and wool. And that was it. The sky had remained consistently gray that whole day, and as I rode the bus home, I saw my father waiting at the end of our long lane on his bike, and with my bike in his other hand. I knew why he had met me, but I could not accept it. As I approached him, I could see the somberness in his eyes. How's Rambo? I asked. My father took a pause and finally said, Rambo's playing in the pastures of heaven, son. He's gone. Join my heart that was dwindling that whole day sank like a fast-moving anchor. My best friend was gone. I said nothing on that bike ride home, and my father understood. Silence seemed like the appropriate way to respect that gentle being. If I cried, my tears were cried in silence. I remember walking into the barn upon hearing the cries of one of the ewes. It was Fiona, Rambo's mother. She was desperately crying out into the distance for her son. She knew he had perished, and you could see that she would have done anything in that moment to have her cherished son return to her. It made me cry. Both me and Fiona grieved together quite audibly for her son, for my friend. My father came out to check on me and started to cry as well, seeing Fiona crying and pacing the stable. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Fiona, he said. We miss him too. Fiona cried and cried for her son, and her son did not return. After this experience, Fiona became incredibly quiet and hardly made a sound the rest of the time she was with us. This was strange, for she had been a talkative youth. She was most certainly mourning her son, long after her son had gone. The experience was one of great sadness. A shining light that was Rambo only got to have his light shine for a month and then departed into the mystery of death. He should have grown old. He should have had his horns curl and been happy and old, but he did not. He left us far too soon. But Fiona, his mother, taught me something. Although he was no longer a part of this world, perhaps in the next, if there is a next, one thing did remain. Our love for him. For even if he is not playing in the fields of heaven, he is alive in the fields of both my and Fiona's soul. Maybe sheep should not have names. Maybe livestock should be treated like items, simply ready for us to eat. I do not know what the right thing to do is there. But I sure am glad Rambo had a Zachary Aaron Armstrong won first place in poetry for Drywall. He's a freshman computer science major, he does not often write poems and stories, but writes a lot of music with lyrics, which is how his first place poem originated. His other interests include playing music, drawing, skating, coding, reading, and spending time with friends. And before college, he played music with friends. His poem was inspired by a sad time in his life that he has since moved on from. The judge's comments about drywall this image-based and century-rich poem explores family, home, and addiction, as well as the hurt that we often bring down upon one another. One can try to patch and repair the damages, but the poem effectively captures how trauma often echoes long after its first occurrence. The staccato and fragmentary form of the verses express vividly and memorably the traumatic and raw sense of the moment. Congratulations, Zachary. Daddy's running out of the house. I think I know it's going down. Put a chair under the doorknob as it echoes. Gone when I woke up in the morning. Bags all full of his belongings. Subtle creaking of the stairs and it still echoes. Stashing old pill bottles in my room. I was afraid of what you would do. 
a shattered mirror on their wall, and it still echoes. Matic drawings on the walls, cluttered fridge of alcohol, a lonely haven of a room, and it still echoes. You have your thing. Sam Grady took mine. second place for his poem, Estimate of the Situation. A junior English major, he says, I wanted to be a film director before writing caught me. He strives to consistently produce a decent amount of writing each day to avoid falling into periods where he hasn't written at all and loses confidence. Reading published work by other writers inspires and motivates him, especially as their success makes him, quote, jealous enough to write better. And Sam has written well. In the 2020 FBA contest, he took second place for his poem and first place for a creative nonfiction essay. In the pandemic, he's missed going to movie theaters, but has gained more time to write. He admits to an unhealthy lifelong obsession with following politics. The inspiration for this poem came from wanting to write about America without explicitly addressing America. The judges said this, this is a poem about us, but also US. How history, politics, ideology, fear and anxiety threaten to drive and in fact have already driven people apart in both personal and nationalistic terms against a backdrop of uncertainty and ambivalence. The poem covers the painful breakdown of a relationship with intelligence and sophisticated irony, especially in the last line, we don't even watch the same shows anymore. Congratulations, Sam. Uh, this poem is called Estimate of the Situation. I like us. We've been okay living together. We still hate other people more than we hate each other, but that's starting to change. We made art about our inevitable breakup for the past few years, making a spectacle of ourselves for everyone else. We've been through so many different guys, and I know I shouldn't care about that. I wish we would try women. Can we try women? But women who agree with me, someone who reads, someone my age, but not a Yale grad. Us, no Karens, us, no Beckys. Other people have been judging us and we're coming off bad. Us, we're the most entertaining people we know. Us, we're huge influencers. Us, we know how to have fun at work. But I'm starting to recognize we're different people. We said we shouldn't quarantine together, and look what happened. I found all your Nazi memorabilia and guns. I love you, but what are you planning? If you look at our history, I mean really go over it. There weren't enough good times. Our trips overseas got worse. You're not taking care of yourself anymore. I get upset the more I learn about us. There's a lot you don't want people to know about us, which I get. I do get that. Us, I have to tolerate your hick accent and you wanting to hurt everyone and you wanting me to go to church. And yes, I know those people have worth, but I, I'm not trying to generalize us, but maybe there's a problem. Can we talk about some of the stuff we used to do? I know it's tough for us to deal with that. I'm also uncomfortable about it. We probably shouldn't be together, but people tell us we're crazy for talking like that. I don't know if there's much left to save here. Is this a good way to spend our 20s? I like us. We had some good ideas. But to be honest, and I think you know this, we don't even watch By the age same seven, shows Rebecca anymore. Rebecca Garcia knew she wanted to be an author and launched a family newsletter in elementary school. Now a third year English major, she interns with Source Brand Solutions, writing for their news platforms, Richland Source, Ashland Source, and Knox Pages. She receives much support for her writing and her major from the Writing Center and the English faculty at OSU Mansfield. Her first place essay in writing across the curriculum is titled Beyond MMA. Sarah Goodlaxon's continuous fight with the patriarchy, a profile written in a class assignment for Dr. Kelly Whitney. The contest judges said, the student has crafted a professional piece of writing that is excellent quality and enjoyable to read. 
a profile of Sarah Goodlaxon is a young woman recognized as an MMA contender, mixed martial arts, and now works to smash the patriarchy and to confront social, religious, and professional barriers. Rebecca resonates with Sarah's story. She left the same religious cult and came out as a member of the LGBTQ community in the past few years. She lives with her partner, Oakley Shaw, and her children, ages four and six. Rebecca says, I write to reclaim myself and to support the truest version of myself. I believe who a person is and what they love to do is always enough, even when it's not the clearest or easiest pathway forward. Congratulations, Rebecca. Beyond MMA, Sarah Goodlockson's continuous fight with the patriarchy. Sarah Goodlockson opens up about her work to smash the patriarchy, detailing social, religious, and professional barriers she's run into along the way. At 10.30 a.m. on the dot, Sarah joins our Zoom meeting from her home in Denver, Colorado, prepared to chat about her work as founder of Modern Co-Marketing, her ongoing project writing a book called Choice, and life beyond her public career as an MMA fighter. Her bangs are pinned back under a knotted headband, the rest of her brown hair pulled into a high ponytail, and she sports round glasses with thin metal frames. She's dressed in a white v-neck tee with Detroit printed in black letters across the front. A tall greenhouse plant sits behind her and an acoustic guitar and framed art prints hang on the medium gray walls, creating a cozy but modern aesthetic. Although it has already been a busy Friday morning catching up with client work, Sarah exudes warmth and enthusiasm as we begin to chat. Have you read the book Educated? If you haven't, you have to read it. I read that book right before I applied to grad school and it sent me over the edge. It's by Tara Westover. She grew up Mormon. She graciously praises the work of other women in an interview about her own work, illuminating how her company's mission to support women in business is a personal undertaking too. Choice is targeted only toward women. I don't care if a single man reads it, she adds with a shrug and a smile. The book project is a full account of her own life with added interviews collected from over 25 other women so far. Among other topics, it addresses domestic violence and abuse of women, often at the hands of men. Still, she thinks reading it could help some men to understand the struggles women face living in a patriarchal society, noting her own husband's reaction to the content. Nate is mind blown. He said, I've never met any men like this, she said. I told him, but I think if you open your eyes, you'll probably see it a lot more. Now, through him understanding my story, he's able to recognize it in other women, even in work settings, and counsel them and give them more grace. When asked about how her work in marketing and branding began, she recalls a time when she was an MMA fighter known by fans as the Piranha. A quick Google search reveals numerous photos of and interviews with Sarah as an MMA fighter. In a 2019 blog post, Sarah wrote, my life was public. Thousands of people watched what I did and followed my MMA career. To this day, I meet people who knew me during that part of my life and considered themselves fans. But something other than muscle developed during those years, a lifelong passion for working with other women in marketing. I was doing a lot of influencer marketing and social media management, like pitches for sponsors for MMA, both for me and other female MMA fighters. I never helped any men because they don't need it, she says, laughing infectiously while pointing to a clear pattern emerging. Growing up in a patriarchal sect. As a little girl, Sarah's future career options felt limited by her family's rigid beliefs about gender roles. They belong to a nameless Christian sect she interchangeably describes as a new religious movement or cult. I wanted to be a nurse because that was okay for women to do, she explains. That was the biggest thing my brain could come up with. But on frequent visits to the local hospital with her father, a pharmacist, she remembers, I would look around and wonder, why am I going to be a nurse? I want to be a surgeon. Everything in my life is always a duality and growing up was exactly the same. Sarah rationalizes that the challenges she faced up growing up within a strange environment were better than any of her alternatives, such as living in extreme poverty with her resentful birth mother in a Nebraska trailer park, or on a communal farm with her birth father's family in Pennsylvania. Born Valerie Dawn in Rock Springs, Wyoming, 
Sarah's name very soon changed to be more biblical when she was adopted by the loving but deeply religious Goodlockson family in Galesburg, Illinois. Childhood was wonderful. My parents are absolute angels minus the whole religion thing, but they're just doing the best they can. They genuinely wouldn't hurt a fly, she says, mentioning that they always provided her and her older brother with learning opportunities and fostered their appreciation for the arts. They both play the piano and violin today. Looking back on her adolescence, Sarah joyfully describes traveling the world, highlighting the summer before high school spent living in the Bahamas in a pink house on a hill overlooking the ocean. Sarah reflects on the experiences of previous generations of Goodlocks and women, noting that historically, American women were controlled by the patriarchal government. My grandmother on my dad's side, Grandma Goodlockson, she was a teacher during World War II. After the war ended, like the United States did to pretty much every other woman, she wasn't allowed to have a job in teaching if she was married, so they fired her. Grandma Goodlockson's daughters and Sarah's aunts, Sharon and Susie, wanted to be, respectively, a pharmacist and a doctor, but it wasn't the government who tried to stop them. Church ministers called sister workers came to Susie and encouraged her to instead pursue administrative work more suitable for women, and she did for a while. After earning a master's degree in accounting, Susie returned to school to become a family nurse practitioner, and she now owns a chain of med spas. Sharon wanted to be a pharmacist, but it wasn't for her. The religion told her that it wasn't. That's not something she should do, Sarah said. She gave up her dream, and her brother, Sarah's father, pursued it instead. Although Sharon always resented that, she eventually earned her master's degree and ran labs at the University of Tennessee before she passed away. Women on my dad's side are highly educated, empowered women still living under the cult or new religious movement umbrella. My mom's family is very abusive and patriarchal, and my grandfather was abusive to her and my grandma and my aunt, who is a sister worker or church minister. But with these examples and her own grit and resilience, Sarah eventually realized she could step outside of the gender expectations drawn around her. I wanted to be a nurse, but then business become, became something a bit more challenging for me and also extremely male dominated, she said. I chose marketing because it's also very creative. Combating religious dogma. But Sarah ran into other detours on her path to higher education. I found out I was pregnant the week of my 18th birthday, Sarah shared. My dad actually asked me if I wanted an abortion and I thought it was a test, so I said no. Today, she knows her father was sincere, but at the time she viewed it as a way of testing her moral character. She had no access to the money in her savings account and also knew she would have to drive to Iowa alone for the procedure. Sarah's boyfriend and the baby's father, Clinton, was a member of her family's religion. He was away at basic training for the army and could only correspond through writing, but he wrote a letter to her father asking for permission to marry her. My mom was freaking out. She was like, I knew this was going to happen. I just thought it would be a schoolboy. I'm like, who do you think I am? All of my friends are having sex. I'm the last one. Sarah weighed her options and determined that marriage was the best one. My other options were to keep the baby and potentially be thrown out of the house, keep the baby and try my chances with my parents, give the baby up for adoption like I was given up for adoption, or I could go live in a different state with some of the church members and have the baby, give it up for adoption, but never tell anyone, and then come back and act like it never happened. Keeping her pregnancy a secret from everyone but her parents, Sarah hatched a plan to graduate high school early with extra credits from her AP classes. She would marry Clinton during his short break between trainings. In order to avoid suspicion, the couple told church members they were getting married because he was in the military and they believed it was what they were supposed to be doing. But before Clinton's basic training was over, Sarah miscarried. I wasn't allowed to go to the hospital to get a DNC because two people in our church worked at the hospital. They were both nurses. It was my dad who said I couldn't go get one. Sarah's eyes glisten and she takes a deep breath. To this day, I'm about to cry over it. They put their daughter physically in danger just because of religious dogma and stigma. Despite the miscarriage, her family pushed for marriage anyway, worrying it would be obvious why the wedding had been called off. We ended up getting married 987, so September 8th of 2007. And I thought those numbers were very telling. I'm like, it's meant to be. But the marriage ended very quickly when she learned Clinton cheated on her with several women within the first few months of marriage. 
I personally talked to four women myself. His brother, Caleb, was the one who alerted me that he was cheating. He called me himself and told me, Sarah recalls. Instead of receiving support from her community, she was met with disbelief and caution. If divorced, she may never be able to take part in church services again, and she could certainly never remarry. In her own words, Sarah was socially excommunicated from the group. Sarah walked away from her shattered marriage anyway, accepting these unfair consequences and openly defying the patriarchal community she was raised in. As she observed the difference in how she was treated versus how Clinton was, it was clear her gender played a strong role. I thought, I'm 19 years old. This is my entire life, and I did nothing wrong. Fighting for Women in MMA in order to get Sarah out of the house during an inevitable post-divorce depression, Sarah's high school best friend dragged her to the basement of a building on Main Street in Galesburg, Illinois to watch mixed martial arts MMA practice. Sarah was captivated. I get annoyed when I don't know something and I want to master it, so I started training upwards of eight or more hours daily at times. Surrounded by strong women literally fighting for their lives, Sarah took notice of how the scales tilted to favor men in their sport. Dana White on camera when I was doing MMA said, nope, women will never be in the USAC. She recalled MMA's substantial gender pay gap and rules that limited the number of rounds women could participate in. Female MMA fighters were only allowed to do three three-minute rounds regardless if you were pro or amateur. Pro male fighters would do three five-minute rounds and then five five-minute rounds for titles, and women were only allowed to do three three-minute rounds, period, because we weren't, you know, as strong. Sarah and her friends knew it was high time to change the sexist system that, pushed, that handed opportunities to men and pushed women down in their sport. When I was doing MMA, the women in my circle were the ones that got the rules changed. We were the pioneers of the sport. After training diligently in MMA for six years from 2008 to 2014, a time of notable progress for women fighters, Sarah was ready to move on. The pay was not enough and she had discovered her passion for empowering women through marketing. I was what we call an atom weight, the smallest weight class there was for MMA at 105 pounds, and that division still doesn't exist in the UFC. I knew it would never exist while I was in my prime, so it was a point when I needed to pivot. I wanted to finish my degree. Knocking out education. When Sarah graduated from college, she had been fighting, slowly fighting to get there for eight years through everything else she was taking classes along the way. The school heard my story and my academic counselor said, you know, you seem a little different. Sarah says, laughing as, as she describes her experience at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan, after she quit training for MMA in 2014. She mimics, mimics the quiet, shy voice she used when meeting with WSU administrators, creating a stark contrast with her confident, lively tone in our meeting today. I was really shy and just said, this is my life. And they were like, oh, she recalls, emphasizing their astonishment. Okay, that explains why you have so many credits from so many different universities. They were kind enough to give me a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration instead of just the BA. I had so many because I had so many credits. I have credits for two bachelor's degrees. As she prepared to finally graduate, Sarah moved away from contract work and invested time in internships to prepare for her first full-time salaried position. I interned with the American Cancer Society, Trademark Produ Productions, and an Australian-based company, Macquarie. Trademark offered me a job before I graduated, so I obviously took it, she said. Although distance from her complicated past and living outside of her family's religious constraints, components of her background continued to show up unexpectedly. I was getting ready to move to Denver. One of my friends at CrossFit said, there's this guy who is nice like you, and I think you should go on a date with him. But from the looks of it, Nate Wylan was not a dating prospect for Sarah at all. He was returning from serving in the military and going through a divorce. No. Been divorced, been engaged, Clinton was in the military, and this guy, he's getting divorced, plus he has big tattoos and he just looks like trouble, all red flags. Grinning, she lift her, lifts her left arm to reveal a nearly full sleeve of tattoos, and here I am. She wouldn't get off my back, so finally I said, fine, I'll go on a date with this guy. In a strange twist of fate, she and Nate discovered their lives were parallel in many ways. They were raised in the same small religious sect, just in different states. 
his ex-wife was in the army and had cheated on him while overseas, and he had also disaffiliated from the group. He, too, was about to move to Denver. It ended up being that my parents had been in church with his parents years before, and they already knew each other. Before long, it was clear they were a perfect match. Understanding one another's unusual upbringing allowed for easy connection without the constant need for explanation. So instead of becoming a nurse, Sarah married one. We don't have to say anything to each other, and we just know. We can mess with each other by walking by and humming a hymn from our past. These are experiences you couldn't have with anybody else. For him to have known that life and to leave it to and to share the same thoughts, feelings, and experiences, you just don't find that anywhere else. To have somebody who understands and loves your family and who doesn't think that they're insane, it is a gift. It's not going to get any better. Her eyes light up as she gushes about Nate and the gift of unconditional love he's given her, including his complete acceptance of her as a bisexual woman. Coming out later in life. At 13, I told my mom I wanted a girlfriend, and she said that marriage is between a man and a woman, and I needed to bury those thoughts and feelings, and I needed to go pray for forgiveness and never speak of it again. So I did that. When I was 16, I was at an annual church convention, and I remember standing there, looking around at everyone, and having a massive sense of sadness, knowing if I really was who I am, all these people I've known my entire life would hate me. And that's true. This year, 18 years after she tried to the first time, Sarah came out to her mom on a phone call, and true to her life's work of empowering and supporting others, she didn't do, do so for her own benefit. They were talking about a family member whose shame from growing up in the same culture of sexual repression has led him to addiction and homelessness. I was trying to tell her how I could help him, and I wondered, how can I tell her how I understand him and what I need to talk to him about if I'm not even willing to be honest with her? So I just blurted it out on the phone. I said, I don't know if you know this, but I'm bisexual. Her mom, initially shaken and dismissive, is coming around after further conversation. I asked her if she remembered saying that to me when I was 13, and she said no. I guess I just wasn't very wise when I was younger. Then she said, I'm sorry if I ever made you feel unwanted or unwelcome. I love you anyway. And I told her, I think what you mean is that you love me unconditionally. Sarah reports, I have no secrets whatsoever. I just went to see my parents again, and it was probably the best time I've ever had with them. It was a decade after being instructed to pray it away before she allowed herself to explore this part of her identity. I buried it until I was 23. I'm away from my family and I just have to figure this out. I don't know if I'm a lesbian. I don't know if I'm bisexual. I don't know what I am. So I secretly just started finding gay bars, but they were just full of men still and there was no place for lesbians to go. I was literally going to gay bars to talk to gay men and asking, where are we supposed to hang out? I had to fight just to find a few lesbians to be friends with. I dated a woman who owned a Brazilian jiu-jitsu school in Tampa, and I knew then, yeah, this, solidifi this solidifies it. I like dating women. But am I a lesbian or do I like men? I spent over three years just trying to figure it out. Eventually, I was like, I do like men, but not a lot. She notes, if it wasn't Nate, I probably would not have married a man. Nate is obviously very supportive, but he also has a lot to learn. He'll say things like, I don't care that you're bisexual. And I have to say, well, I need you to care. Because if you say you don't care, it means you don't see me. Remarkably, from within a heteronormative appearing marriage, she mentions it looks like a straight woman married to a straight man, Sarah finally found the peace to embrace an identity her religious past had stifled and ignored. Now I have this big old pride flag flying outside, and it's the first time I've ever lived my life celebrating me and giving myself permission to celebrate myself instead of hiding it. If I hadn't gone through all of that, I never would have gotten these gifts. Supporting the queer community is also part of Sarah's business mission and her com company's brand values. She explains that Modern Co. Company's website uses the inclusive spelling W-O-M-X-N because the backbone of modern co is intersectional feminism. Fighting for women in business and writing. Women needed help and women still need help. There's a boys club, Sarah said. Framing her business in this way and speaking publicly about gender issues and trauma is a very intentional choice. And it has brought Sarah clients she can connect with on a different level. Because of her own vulnerability, women often share their own stories. 
She, observ she observes even through just marketing and helping them build their business through conversations and support, it does heal physically. For the past two years, Sarah has also worked on her book project, Choice, by writing her story and conducting interviews with other women who want to tell their stories. Specifically, she interviews women who have dealt with one or more of the following, domestic violence, abusive relationships, sexual abuse and assault, teen pregnancy, miscarriage, divorce, addiction to drugs and alcohol, or adoption. Sarah has firsthand experience with all of these. Although she championed empowerment for other women in MMA, she simultaneously found herself in a dark corner when she began dating her coach. I fell into a very abusive relationship for three years. There was domestic violence, emotional, and psychological abuse on every level. He was abusive around school as well. He'd ask, why are you taking time out of your training to go to class? The way I felt at the time, I don't feel this way anymore, was that people can do whatever they want to me and I'm the strong one. I can take it and you can abuse me, but you're not going to abuse anybody else. Inspired in her own ongoing fight to smash the patriarchy, Sarah is determined to empower and support other women through her work and writing. In group support settings with the Wings Foundation here in Colorado, the majority of the women in my group are just kind of frozen in time for the rest of their lives. I mean, they're 60 to 70 years old, and some of them never said a word to their abusers. In a lot of cases, that's family. It affected them physically, emotionally, and psychologically for the rest of their lives. My biggest goal is for women to be able to read this book and see themselves in it and understand the different ways they can get out and that they're not alone because that's the biggest barrier to entry right now, not having anybody to talk to, not having a support system and feeling like you are absolutely alone. Those are the most dangerous situations for women to be in, especially when they leave and don't have the means to have any sort of safety net. That's when they're murdered. If we can prevent any abuse on any level, then we need to do it. Sarah is living proof that the fight to overcome gender barriers socially, religiously, and professionally is never ending, but ultimately worthwhile. When asked who empowered her, she looks fiercely into the camera and says, me, I have a very strong pull to be more than I am. I want to be the best and I want to do the best and I want to know the most. I don't settle, I don't stop, I will do what I want to do and I'm going to make it happen. Thank you.